So a number of years ago, I found myself, while crossing the George Washington Bridge, stuck in terrible traffic. I had six kids in the car with me. I had my three kids and the three kids of a colleague. And some of you probably know this. When you're stuck in traffic on the George Washington Bridge, you can kind of get pinned up against another car for minutes on end. You have like a neighbor. And we found ourselves pinned up against an enormous truck. And on the side of this truck, painted all in white, sprawled across the truck, probably 50 feet long, wearing a white fur bikini, was Kim Kardashian. I think at the bottom of the truck, it might have said something like, desire. If it didn't, it should have. <laughs> and of course, the six kids in the car with me, they started to make jokes. They ranged in ages probably from five or six to about 10. And they were laughing and giggling and making jokes, and I laughed and giggled with them. And this sort of like reptilian parent brain, I knew there was something I, wish I should have said. I knew there was a conversation there for me, some question to ask. Maybe it was about desire. Maybe it was about modesty. Maybe it was about advertising. At worst, I could have asked them why they were laughing. But I told myself, you know what? It's one thing to talk to your own kids, but uh, these aren't just my kids. And I said, I'll get to this later at dinner. Well, of course, I didn't get to it later at dinner, because at dinner, I thought the moment had passed. Why bring this up again? But looking back, I know, I, it, wasn't really, it wasn't really that well thought out, to be honest. I think I didn't know what I wanted to say. And because I didn't know what I wanted to say, I felt a little anxious and I felt a little scared. When I think back on that moment, it actually takes me back to another moment even longer ago, when I was probably in my early teens. My brother and I had rented the movie Monty Python and the Meaning of Life. Some of you may have seen this movie. And there's a scene in this movie, a sex ed class set in a stuffy British boarding school taught by John Cleese. And in order to teach his students about sex, he decides to bring his wife in, and he proceeds to have sex with her in front of the students, all while describing in very clinical terms exactly what he's doing. And I think I remember the students dutifully taking notes, but that part I might be making up. And it was at that exact scene when my father decided to come in and see what we were watching. <laughs> my brother and I were horrified. We had no idea what to do. We didn't know what our father was going to say. We didn't know what he was going to do. We were in a total panic. We thought maybe he's going to yell at us, throw the video out the window. But my father did something great then. He sat and watched the scene with us, and he laughed. And the scene ended, and he left the room. And thank God that's what he did. It could have gone a lot worse for my brother and I that day. But I'll tell you what he didn't do. We didn't talk about it at dinner that night. He never brought it up either. And I wonder whether for my kids that moment crossing the George Washington Bridge was kind of their Monty Python moment, a moment when their parent had the opportunity to talk to them about sex and took a pass. And I've been teaching sex ed in SER High School for a number of years. And I can't say I've learned that much, but one thing I've learned is that when I take a pass, I do my kids a terrible disservice. I send them the message that this conversation is one that we should be embarrassed about. And I know that I have to teach and I have to model for them open and honest and vulnerable conversation about sex. And my stories, the stories that I just shared with you, are personal. But I actually think it's a pretty universal message. I think it applies not just to parents. I'm sure some of you are parents. But I think it applies to anyone who's in the position of caretaker for kids. And the question we need to ask ourselves is how do we grow as sex educators, not in schools, but in our own homes? When I think about this question, my mind turns to a really strange and fascinating moment in the Gemara, the story of Rav Kahana, who apparently didn't get the information he needed from his teacher, Rav, in the Beit Midrash. So he decides to go and hide under his teacher's bed while his teacher, Rav, is having sex with his wife. And at some point, he must hear something he says out loud. And it is as if my master has never supped this dish before. And Rav is, of course, horrified to find his student hiding under his bed. And he rebukes him. And Rav Kahana says, this too is a matter of Torah, and I must learn it. Rav Kahana has the last word there. And I wonder, when I think about this Kamara, under whose bed will my kids hide if I don't initiate conversations with them? And I think the internet, to some extent, is the 21st century equivalent of hiding under your teacher's bed. Is that where I want them to learn about sex? So why is it so hard? And my mind turns to another 
story in the Gemara, the story of Rabbi Lazar ben Dordia. It's one of a few stories in the Gemara where a scholar or a rabbi decides to visit a prostitute. And he hears about this famous prostitute. He sends her money. He arranges this visit. He travels a long distance. And he's about to consummate the moment with her when she passes gas. And he, the Gemara suggests, withdraws from her, presumably in disgust. And she is mad. She is spitting mad. And she curses him. She says, just as this wind will pass from my body and not be brought back, so too will Rabbi Azar pass from God's graces and not be brought back. Despite this choice, he, it turns out he's a pretty from guy. This curse really, really gets him. He collapses to the ground and he begins to appeal to all the elements of the natural world to intercede on his behalf between he and God. He begs the mountains, the rivers, the oceans, the stars, the sun, the moon, please talk to God for me. And one by one, all of these elements of the natural world tell him it is up to you and you alone. And with one last cry of anguish, recognizing that this is a conversation only he can have, he collapses and dies on the spot. At which point, a heavenly voice issues forth and says, Rabbi Lazar has, at this moment, earned his share in the world to come. His tshuva has been accepted. It's a really strange story. And at first blush, it does not have a lot to teach me about my life. But there are two elements in it that I actually can sympathize with. The first is communication. The key to this story is communication. There is a conversation that Rabbi Lazar is supposed to have that on some level he wants to have. But on another level, he wants everything else in the world to have this conversation for him. And the second ingredient, the second element that I can sympathize with in this story is that if we assume that for Rabbi Lazar, coming to terms with his sexual identity will involve a number of missteps, and that the redemptive ingredient is the ability to communicate in an open and vulnerable and honest way about those missteps, then the question that comes out of this Gemara for me is, how do I teach my kids to communicate in a way that will, for them, prove redemptive? There's a wonderful psychologist named Rollo May who writes really beautifully about what happens to us when we allow our anxieties to become the guiding principle by which we make choices in our lives. And specifically, he writes about sex. He says that sometimes our anxiety is so deep that we move like the blind, where nobody can see another, and where our touching is at best a sightless fumbling, moving our fingers over the body of another, desperately trying to recognize him, but trapped in a kind of self-enclosing darkness. It's a haunting image. And what he's suggesting is that what's at stake in being able to communicate openly about sex is nothing less than the ability to have a meaningful relationship with another human being. And that's what I want for my kids. That matters. So we schools and we teachers, we need to do our part. And there are some things we need to do. Some of them we're already doing here at SAR. We need to have small group sex ed discussions so kids can ask their questions and more kids can have their voices heard. We probably need to create opportunities for co-ed conversations so boys can hear from girls and girls can hear from boys. And like we did today, I think the Torah can be a wonderful springboard for conversations about sex that are personal, but not so personal that they become titillating. We, teachers, need to model open dialogue about sex for our students. And lastly, we need to tell them that that's what we're doing. We need to be transparent about transparency, to tell them that being vulnerable is, in fact, the key ingredient. And you got to practice that. But ultimately, I actually think it's not schools where this is going to take place in the most powerful way, but the home. And the question for me as a parent, and maybe for some of you as parents or caretakers of kids, is how do we bring the lessons of sex ed programs from the school into our homes? I don't think there's any magic to this, but I have a few thoughts on this. The first is the talk. You probably know what the talk is. I heard a comedian once talk about the pill. Right? It's not the pill that cures polio. Right? This, this use of the article, the, speaks to our collective obsession with sex, the talk, the pill. A friend once shared with me that he'd gone on a long two-hour walk with his son, and they had the talk. He was so proud. And at the time, I was like, oh, I got to do that. But since then, I've come to realize that there is no the talk. 
The talk is an ongoing conversation that spans years of our children's psychological, social, and sexual development. There is no single moment that sums up what it is we need to talk to our kids about. Second, seize the day. Especially in the 21st century, opportunities are going to regularly present themselves to us to have conversations about sex with our kids. And every time we pass up on those conversations, we send them the message that we're uncomfortable with them. We need to seize those opportunities, not let them pass us by. Third, like in schools, I think the Torah is a wonderful springboard for us to talk to our kids about sex. And lastly, it's OK to admit to our kids that the conversation is a little bit embarrassing sometimes. My kids are the first to tell me how mortified they are when I try to talk to them about sex, my son especially. He hates it. But it's OK for me to tell him it's uncomfortable for, for me too. It's even OK for me to tell him sometimes I'm not sure what to say. We can laugh at ourselves when we admit we're embarrassed. And laughter is a great conversation starter. I want to end by sharing something that happened to me early in my teaching career here at SAR. We had a panel discussion in the Beit Midrash. I don't even remember what the panel discussion was about. I know it had to do with sex. I only remember what happened afterwards. When a student came over to me and pulled me to the side of the Beit Midrash, he wanted to share with me his experience of a certain sin he kept committing. That was his phrase, a certain sin. And he told me that he would daven and study Torah and do the mitzvot that he loved to do. And the temptation to commit this certain sin would grow in him until eventually he found himself unable to resist committing the certain sin. He would give in, succumb to the temptation, and for a few days he'd feel too guilty to daven or study Torah, until the guilt would recede and he'd return to his practice of mitzvot. And he told me that he found himself trapped in this cycle, this feedback loop, unable to feel comfortable with himself, constantly obsessing over this certain sin. And I tried to tell him, how normal it was and how healthy it was. And I told him that God wants us to do mitzvot no matter what else is happening. But I, I also remember all too clearly what I didn't do. I didn't use the word masturbation. He said a certain sin. I said a certain sin. And in my head, I thought, I'm protecting him. I don't want to make him uncomfortable. But I think what I was really doing was participating in a specialized form of silence around sex. I think I was reiterating for him in repeating that phrase, a certain sin, that there was, in fact, something to be ashamed of or embarrassed about, that this was a conversation I wasn't comfortable having. When opportunities present themselves for me to talk to my kids, I often remember that student. There is usually a voice in my head telling me, maybe you can have this conversation later. But I think back on that student. I think back on that certain sin in that moment. And I refuse to listen to that voice. I refuse to listen. Thank you very much.